and be more critical of what we are being fed, uh, both in terms of marketing and the food. Um, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll now move to our next and last session of the evening, which again takes a look at a very different aspect of how we need to live our lives, which is that of risk-taking, innovation, and leadership, uh, using the entrepreneurial mindset of a mountaineer. So if I could have David Liano, who's an adventurer, entrepreneur, author, peak performance coach and inspirational speaker up on stage, and our fellow Thai charter member, Kapil Malhotra, director of Total Solutions Group, on the stage. I think that'd be very helpful so we can get our last session started. Okay, so it's, I'm, I'm told that it's a recorded session, so we're gonna play the recording uh, on the screen now. Very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kapil Malhotra. I'm the director at Total Solutions Group. And it is my absolute privilege and honor to have David Liano on our talk today. I'm going to do a quick introduction to David. So David Liano Gonzalez is the first mountaineer to double summit the Mount Everest from both Nepal and Tibet sites, for which the Guinness Book of World Records awarded him in 2013. He has climbed both versions of the seven summits. David started his journey with climbing at the age of 13, when he started climbing the volcanic peaks in Mexico. As of today, he has summited 23 years of climbing experience and summited the Mount Everest seven times. Again, a Guinness record for a double ascent in the same season. Several 8,000 meter peak climbs, highest mountain in every continent in the world, several ascents in the Alps, the Andes, North America, etc. In 2018, David decided to combine his passion with a purpose, the purpose being to spread the message for depression and working hand in hand to spread awareness for the Live Life Foundation founded by the veteran leading Indian actor Deepika Padukone. The project happens to be one of his most ambitious projects in the history. Apart from these fabulous achievements, David enjoys other adventures like single-handed sailing across the world, flying helicopters, and mostly paragliding as well. He has several years of experience in high altitude flights in the Mexican volcanoes, Nepal, the Himalayas, northwest of the United States and several other flight sites in Mexico. He also enjoys ultra marathons and has participated in several Ironman tri triathlons. Over 18 marathons, hundreds of road races, endurance cycling, and a few one-day adventure races. David is also a part of the Explore, which was founded in New York City in 1904 a hub for the world's first and foremost explorers, which currently has members like Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, and Elon Musk. Despite finance being his primary profession, he lives a life of adventure. David, a great pleasure having you today from Seattle, Washington. We would have loved to host you in person in Delhi, in India, but I really, really thank you for joining us today on this recording. Thanks, David, for joining us. Thanks, Yadav. Thank you so much for this opportunity to uh, be a part of, of Thai, to be uh, talking to you today, to be sharing my experiences. I, just listening to the very kind introduction, I got a little bit tired of uh, you know, remembering all, all these adventures. So it's, it's really a privilege to be here, to be sharing some of my experiences. Fantastic. So I'm going to get into all the questions that I've noted down over the last one month. The list will go on and on. Let me see how much we can cover today. And I'm going to start by saying there are two sides of your life. One is this life of adventure. And then there's a, there's a professional side, you being a, a, you know, a finance person. Uh, as a finance person, you're an entrepreneur where you invest in companies yourself. And you also run a multi-family office as well, where you guide ultra HLIs to invest in, in companies as well. In both these lives, there's a risk and reward analysis that you do. 
how do you weave these two together or do you weave them together absolutely um well, like you i am an accountant uh, by by profession i started my professional career as a financial analyst and in, at some point i i was climbing mountains i was running around the world and it was a little bit difficult to combine these two sides uh, simultaneously uh, many adventures seek sponsorship by big companies and they do this for a living or they are guides and they do this for a living but in in my case uh, when i was around 25 years old i decided to stop analyze where i was where i wanted to to be the kind of life that i wanted to live which was this combination of the professional side and the adventure side and uh, that's that's what i did i started working remotely uh, in in finance about 17 years ago when nobody was really working remotely and everyone was stuck in the, in the office and I was able to design this life for myself, which I've been able to combine uh, even when I was on an expedition, uh, climbing mountains for two months. I had a satellite phone, I had one of those old PDAs, uh, uh, and I would just connect to the satellite, download my email, and just keep, keep working. And so I think that's what made everything possible, having this balance with, with, uh, between the professional uh, life and finance, and the adventure side, which complement each other very, very well because they're both about risk analysis, you know, the risks that we have in the mountain and how to overcome them, how to be successful and reach the summit safely and come back down. And in finance, how to get the, the best returns with uh, an acceptable amount of risk. And just, uh, uh, it's, it's two very different sides that match each other perfectly in my opinion. You know, just, just getting into this into a little more, if, if I was one of the ultra HNIs uh, in, in, in North or South America and looking at your profile, I would maybe look at David to be an ultra risk taker, you know, which means that the companies that you would want me to invest in would be maybe higher on the risk, which also means they're higher on the reward. So when you plan for these summits, I'm sure there's a tremendous amount of planning that you put in place. I've seen and read about you doing swimming, you doing paragliding, doing ultra marathons, climbing these mountains. There's a lot of planning that goes into this. I'm assuming you must be planning almost three, six months, one year in advance because you need to slot the dates, you need to take permissions, you need to get your crew together. Uh, similarly, when you look at investments, how does that planning uh, experience or, or that knack that you built, how does that come into the appeal? Yeah, you said something very interesting. Uh, sorry, very interesting, in which I, I'm not a high risk taker, I think I'm a high risk mitigator. What I try to do is separate the risks that are, I would say, under my control, that I can do something about whether it's in investing or in, in, in the adventure side, let's say the, the mountains, there are some risks that are uh, out of my hands, like in rockfall, avalanche, etc. But I can decide when to go up. If there's avalanche risk, I can stay at base camp for a few days until the risk dies down. Uh, I can choose a better route if there's rockfall, if there's bad weather coming. So, for me, is not just taking a lot of risk, it's mitigating the, the risk, the inherent risk as much as possible. And then there will always be some uncertainty, yet, just like there's in finance and in adventure. In, there, will, there will be that small element of risk, which we have to accept if we want to have some return or if we want to reach uh, a, a, a peak. Um, but like you said, it's all about planning. It takes months, even years, to plan for uh, a climb or an expedition. And the execution can be very short. It can be maybe just a couple of days climbing. It can be maybe two months on Mount Everest, yeah, as an example. 
And in the end, we're at the summit for just a few minutes, if we're lucky. Um, the more we plan, the better we plan, the more we use our current skills and we, um, we learn the new skills that we might need for, for a, a new project, the better prepared we will be, the um, uh, better chances of success, the better we will be able to adapt uh, if, if something unforeseen uh, happens. And it is with good planning uh, comes good execution and with good execution comes uh, success. And uh, with this side of learning new skills sometimes, let me give you an example. I was just involved in a very ambitious pro uh, project in uh, South America in which I was the first person to ascend 7,000 meters uh, and the problem here was that the highest peak in the southern hemisphere is 6,962 meters high, which it's missing 38 meters to reach 7,000 7, meters. And so what I did is if I couldn't get any higher, I could start from lower, which means I would have to dive in the Pacific Ocean without any uh, diving equipment, just a mask, holding my breath, go down 40 meters and then start ascending from there uh, back to the surface and then getting on a bicycle, riding all the way to the mountain for many days and then uh, doing all this climb. And for that, I needed a new skill for me, which was free diving. Just holding my breath for minutes and, and diving to, to that depth. And even though I had the mountaineering side well covered, I had, to, I had to learn this new skill and it took me months of training and practice. Uh, and the execution for the free dive was only one minute, 20 seconds, but it took months to learn this new skill. You know? So that's the planning and execution side. I think what a great uh, way to explain how, you, how you, you got through that 38 meters of a shortfall on the 7,000 meters. Um, you know, I think maybe like we say in India, we call it the J-factor. You know what the J-factor is? No. Okay, so since you're married to an Indian, uh, the J-factor is Jugaad. You would have heard of that word for sure. I, I know Jugaad, yes. You know what Jugaad is. We call it frugal innovation. But what was interesting is that, you know, it's not shortcuts. It's the planning that goes behind it. For that one minute, 32 seconds, you would have put in a lot of hours and, and maybe a few weeks and a couple of months as well to, to get that in place. But what's important is that you don't have to change the geography, you don't have to go to another mountain. You figured out the clause of 7000 and you figured out a way on how to do it through cycling and deep diving, which which, uh, which David is amazing at. And as Indian entrepreneurs, you know, we do the, a lot of that on a, on, not on a daily basis, but yeah, we do a lot of that on a regular basis. We pivot, we find opportunities, and I think that is an inherent trait in, in entrepreneurs, not about Indian entrepreneurs only. But as entrepreneurs, that we always have to look at how to find ways and means to move and to be agile and to succeed in those as well. So I think that's a that's an amazing one, uh, David. Thanks for sharing that uh, incident. It, it, it becomes it makes things a lot relatable as well. Um, one thing that I also wanted to to talk to you about is you know the success of these achievements that you've made. Um, you know, summiting the Mount Everest from, from both the sides, um, you know, being covered in, in the Guinness Book. And the next achievement after that, and the next achievement after that. Uh, similarly, we see in the entrepreneur space as startups, you know, you hit your 1 million, which is 0 to 1, then you do your 100 million. And there's a unicorn where, you know, today in India, we're producing unicorns at, a, at an amazing pace and speed. And then we're moving to the Decacom as well. What we see is that this is an ongoing uh, cycle. You need to keep on achieving more. What has been your your quest towards this? And what motivates you? What is that thing that takes you ahead? What what is that trait that enables you to to do the next? Keeping in mind that your physical strength might be tapering down as your age is progressing. Is it mind over matter? Is it something else? And the lesson that we want to pick up from you, David, is that as entrepreneurs, we have the same challenges when it's a new day in business. 
COVID comes and starts a new love affair with the business world. Uh, you have people leaving the organization, you have challenges around. Uh, there's so many issues that we have as an entrepreneur, but we need to scale new heights. So what's your mantra on that? What's, what's the mindset that you need to have for this? Well, I would say, first of all, in my case, the motivation is completely internal. These are personal projects. I set myself the goal and it's in my hands to achieve it, to, to do everything that I can to get to that peak, to complete this uh, uh, paradigm uh, cross-country flight, for example, uh, to run across a desert. I am the one that's setting the goal and it's in my hands to, to uh, com complete it. And there is definitely uh, obstacles uh, in, in the way, but that those obstacles are are the the, the essence of, of adventure. And adventure, by definition, has an uncertain um, uh, outcome. You know? So it's definitely within my hands to, to, to do everything to, to reach those goals. But many of these projects are part of a bigger picture. And let me give you an example. You mentioned climbing the highest mountain on each continent. And there's seven continents, so each peak has its own challenge. It requires its own planning. And one, the, the risk can be uh, being one of the coldest mountains in the world, like uh, Mount Denali in Alaska, or um, just being in an extremely remote place like Mount Vincent in Antarctica, or the, the uh, altitude of Everest. And for me, that was a project that took two and a half years, and it would have been very easy to get lost along the way. Even though I was planning for each of the expeditions, I always kept in mind the bigger picture, which was all seven mountains. In, so be focused on, on, on what you're doing right now, but keeping the big picture in mind, I think that's essential. And for me, it's always been about setting myself ambitious goals and also having a logical progression. Like you said, maybe uh, first you, uh, a company starts by focusing on uh, the first um, one lakh rupees in sales, right? You, maybe you're thinking of, uh, you know, we'll become a unicorn, we'll be uh, selling a uh, hundred crore uh, rupees, but you're not, you're not at that stage right now. You have to plan, you have to focus on where you are right now and always keeping in mind where you, you want to get to and what is the path that will get you there. That's strategic planning, no? So always keeping that in mind. When uh, I, did this double ascent of Mount Everest uh, in 2013. It was a progression from, I had uh, started climbing almost 20 years before when I was a little boy. And I had summited Mount Everest for the first time in 2005. Then three years later, I decided to climb Mount Everest and Loxi, the fourth highest mountain in the world in the same season, which is something that I did. Uh, and I, I kept setting myself more ambitious goals more ambitious goals. In mountains that seemed too technical at first for me, I, I knew what the challenges were, what, what the risks were, and which other mountains I had to go to to train to that big peak. For example, uh, K2 in, in uh, Pakistan, which is a very dangerous mountain, which I have summited. In. So I always keep my next goal in mind. Even, for example, I mentioned about this 10,000 meter ascent. When I came off the mountain, my mind was not thinking, oh, I just did this. It was thinking, okay, I am ready for the next challenge. I came down from the mountain and I signed up for skydiving lessons, which I'm starting this Saturday. And I'm very excited about it. And uh, once I'm done with, with skydiving, I'll, I'll, I'll ha already have something else in my plan, which is running uh, 250 kilometers unsupported in the Sahara Desert. But always keeping the next goal in mind, but not losing sight of what I'm doing right now. Phenomenal. I think that's truly inspiring. Uh, we're talking about achievements. I want to know about your failures, because 
that's a reality. It's not always going to be the best weather. It's not going to be the, the perfect crew. There are going to be so many challenges. But let's talk about failures for, for a minute or two. What have you, what are the failures that have happened or the major obstacles that have happened on some of these summits or some of these journeys? And did you have to come halfway down? What happened next? Absolutely. Um, see, for example, one thing that I combine a lot is paragliding, which is uh, flying off the mountains with mountaineering itself. So I climb the paraglider on my backpack. At the summit, I spread it out, and I, if I'm lucky, I run off the mountain and I'm back at base camp in a few minutes instead of taking many hours on a risky terrain. And I will tell you that perhaps half the time I have to walk down with the paraglider because conditions are not safe for me to, to walk down. And I, for example, I don't see those as failures. I just see them as part of the process, you no? Know? If I'm lucky, I'm able to fly up the summit. If not, I have to walk down. But being more specific, one of the biggest challenges that I've had to face was how to complete this double ascent of Everest. Climbing on Mount Everest is done mainly in the spring, and reaching the summit is limited to about two weeks in the month of May because of weather conditions. That's when the winds are lower and it's safer uh, to, to go up to, to that altitude. Right. Uh, so climbing both sides of the mountain within the same season is a very challenging endeavor because you have to plan for two expeditions simultaneously uh, without being physically present on the other side of the mountain to see that everything is running right and then being lucky with the weather. It's like having two startups and both of them becoming unicorns. In how many days did you do it? In eight days, which is a really big challenge. But that, that's not the way that I started this challenge. My original plan was on climbing one side, coming down, going around, climbing the other side and coming down. It was climbing one side to the top, descending on the opposite side of the other country, right. and then a few days later, climbing back to the summit on that same side, and going back to where I started, which was a double traverse. I faced a really big challenge, which was the Chinese bureaucracy. They were not willing to let someone into their country without going through a border checkpoint. And there's no border checkpoint at this moment. I found everything. So thinking of how I could do something challenging, but overcome this big peak that was the, the Chinese bureaucracy, I, I decided if I cannot go across the border, then I'll just climb one side, back down, around through a border checkpoint, and up again as fast as possible. It, it took me three attempts to be able to complete this challenge. And on the first two, I was doing things that I later, later found out were not ideal, uh, or were complicating things instead of making it easier. For example, I was trying to climb the Chinese side before the Nepal side, and I found that it was a mistake because it was it was um, the, the the climbers were reaching the summit earlier on the Nepal side. So that was a big lesson that, that I learned. And on those first two attempts, I only saw it once, and I don't see that as a failure at all. I see it as preparation for the successful expedition that I had two years later. I believe that if you are faced with these challenges, if, if you don't reach your goal and you just leave it at that, then it is definitely a failure. But if you take these experiences, you extract the lessons from them, you plan using those new lessons and you execute well, then those are not failures. Those are just steps that are preparing you to be successful. And that's exactly what happened to me in 2013 with this double set of plans. Amazing. David, do you attribute a lot of this in the self-belief, in the mental makeup that you have as an individual? Or do you also leave some of this to some unseen power, some forces that have blessed you? Or do you put it to 
entire planning that goes behind it. What's what's the faith and trust and belief mechanism or mode that helps you summit these these things? That's a very good question. Um, in, in my case, as I mentioned, the motivation is completely internal. This this drive that I have is not. I'm not doing it for money. There's no payout for me. At, 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 the, uh, at the summit or after the expedition, there's no brand involved. I don't have any commitments. It's because I believe that I can do this and I do everything within my power to execute. Um, so when the motivation is internal, I also internalize uh, what happens uh, out there. I don't blame the mountain if, if I'm not able to summit. I don't blame the weather. I blame myself or I take responsibility for what happens and I, I try to improve uh, the next time. And I think many of the characteristics that make a good climber, a good investor, are very similar. Being patient, being flexible, being analytical, uh, adaptable, surrounding yourself with a good team, in, I, th I, th I think they're very, very uh, compatible. And definitely mental toughness is essential in this kind of activities that, that I do, because most of the time we have hundreds of reasons for giving up, for saying, you know, it's, it's too dangerous, I'll just turn around. Instead of saying, it's too dangerous, how can I make it safe? How uh, uh, this... better train to go over this, this obstacle. Uh, so I try to internalize all that and not just try to find a, 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 who is to blame. It's how can I make this possible? It's up to me because it is my motivation to go after this goal and complete it. I think one of the clear lessons, David, that I've just picked up, and I think a lot of elite sports uh, people and athletes talk about uh, not only the resolve, but also the amount of work that goes behind that resolve in terms of scaling those summits, breaking those world records. It is clearly not by chance that these things happen. It's, it's a constant endeavor. And I think also building a business, uh, the entrepreneurial journey, as we say, is brick by brick. And over a period of time, you see that pieces of bricks turning into a great monument. Uh, we as, as India and Indians, as, as the land of entrepreneurs, you know, we've, we've been lucky by having, you know, such a great ecosystem. And especially at time, you know, we're trying to, to foster this as a, as a not-for-profit organization to get great great speakers like you to share your experience. If, if, if you may allow, I want to get into, you know, your personal side as well. When you were a kid, you know, that teenager, uh, you didn't know that you would be scaling mountains and creating these records, right? Uh, what? You can't clearly envision you, you raising the flag or having that message on top of those mountains. Yet, the desire is there. We at times see that everyone has that desire, but not everyone is able to, to scale those peaks. So I want to get into that mind of David 20 years ago, a little more, when you were that teenager. What was your thought process? Like you very well said, I never thought that I would be uh, climbing the highest mountains in the world and doing it so successfully. Um, I, I really see myself as an ordinary person being able to do extraordinary things because of this resolve and this, uh, this drive uh, that I have. But I, I think that this, this we, we grow up with this fire inside us and most of the time, and I see it a lot with people, they have all these dreams, they have all these plans, and it's really hard for them to take that first step. You know? 
India, as you very well said, is the land of entrepreneurs. But many times it's just comfortable. Thank you, I lost you for a second. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Um, if, if, yeah, if you have the safety net, maybe it's it's really hard. It's very you're in a very comfortable spot. I don't want to take that that risk. You know, why risk everything that I have for this uh, dream that I have? You know, this this uh, new business that I can start. So taking that first step and taking the risk is is, is difficult. And I think at some point something changed in my life. I cannot tell you what happened, but um, when I was around 22, 23 years old, after university studying finance, uh, being an accountant, um, so, so some switch uh, was uh, uh, you know switch on in, in, in my mind, and I, I was just taking first steps all the time. So, the, the, the reason that uh, I like sharing my experiences, it's, it's not about me, it's not about showing up. Uh, I've been completely off social media for the last few years because for me it was never about climbing a mountain and posting a selfie on the Sunday and saying, look how great uh, I am. Uh, it was uh, when I was sharing all this, and this kind of talks also, is to be an example for people. No? Take that first step. Take risk, calculated risk, but there's a way to do it, you know? Uh, go after your dreams. If you've always wanted to start a small business, start it. You, know? uh, you will you'll be okay if you have this entrepreneurial mind. Whatever you do, you'll be okay because you'll try one thing after the other and you'll find the right one. You no, know? but taking that first step, taking those risks is, is something that I do in business, that I do in, on, on the mountains. and. It is, it is possible, no? so I, I'm always inviting people go after these dreams, these projects that, that you have, take that first step. Uh, that's amazing and uh, you know coming down to the your finance world, to the, to the business side as well, uh, looking at how the global economy is moving, looking at the world of AI, looking at healthcare, the way things are changing in the world, looking at how automotives and paradigms are coming in. What are your takes on the next key trends of how the world is going to shape up over the next, maybe a decade is too long to say. What do you, what do you see? If you crystal gaze, what are the next five years going to be? I think the way that things are advancing now, uh, especially with AI, as you mentioned, is fascinating. You know, this, this, where we are right now, where we were, a couple of years ago, it's a completely uh, different universe. Um, a lot of the investing that I do has been in technology uh, that is just looking for solutions to problems that we have uh, right now. But there's a long way to go with uh, with uh, with just implementing technology on traditional uh, problems. No? I, I, I can't really go uh, into specifics, but uh, de 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 definitely uh, technology-based solutions for so many industries. And I mean, a lot of it right now is coming out of India. So uh, I think investors from all over the world will always be looking for uh, opportunities, whether directly uh, through uh, funds and supporting all these uh, innovations uh, that I mean, could be through AI or, or, or not, uh, but just technology solving traditional problems. Have you made an investment in India till now, uh, Not directly, through funds, yes. In, but uh, many of the companies that I've invested with, um, for example, uh, one that I can mention is, is called CargoPod, uh, which is uh, a platform for uh, the shipping industry in the US. And uh, 
right now in the process of connect, uh, integrating AI uh, to the to the technology uh, through Indian uh, companies. So cool. uh, even, even though not directly, definitely uh, India is present in in everyone's mind uh, right now uh, with so many interesting things and so much talent that, that, that is, is there in India that perhaps uh, uh, a few decades ago um, people had to go abroad and Indians had to go abroad to uh, be in this industry but now the industries are going to India to look for this talent and they're basing themselves in India to, to be able to benefit from this, this, this talent. You've exported one of our great talents from India as your better half. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, full marks to you. My last question is going to be, what does she say? What does Pratna say when you look at the next quest? What's her, what's her feedback? What's her, uh, what's her emotion? What's her, what does she say? Yeah, uh, I, I, my wife is incredibly uh, supportive. With what I do, just the same as with my family, uh, my, my parents, my brother, growing up. Uh, it was really important to me every time that I reached the summit to get there uh, and uh, bring a photo of them with me to, to the summit and take a satellite phone and make a call to them, just sharing the, the, the experience and thanking them for making it possible. You know? so it's the same thing for my wife. I <laughs> see. I think for the first time that I mentioned a new uh, project or adventure, like this skydiving thing, the, the first thing is she rolls her eyes like, okay, here's, here's another uh, uh, risk that he's taking. But I believe that uh, my track record is there. My track record for safety. Safety is essential to me. Uh, it is very common for mountaineers, which have been on the mountains, and the highest mountains to end up losing fingers to frostbite, toes to frostbite. I have all my fingers, all my toes, because I think I've proven that I can be safe up there. And when I am taking on new risks, I do it in an informed way. And I train myself before I take on that risk. And then I can do the same thing. So I have my family's support. I've always had it. I have my wife's support because of this track record, or because I have shown them that I made these good decisions. I think that's amazing. I think to create a great business, if you plan yourself very well, uh, as if you're going to summit the tallest or the highest mountain, I'm sure you will find adversities your way. But if you're better planned, um, I think the chances of you reaching the summit, whether it's a business or whether it's a mountain, would definitely be higher. David, you have left us with so many important takeaways today. I wish I could get on to more details and why did you leave social media, uh, your, your faith in Buddhism, uh, your, your, your talks with your son, what you talk to him about, uh, peeping into your brain into, into the next few years from a business side. I wish we could do more of that as well. Uh, but it's been a great conversation, truly inspiring. Uh, very, very happy uh, and proud of you as an individual, especially uh, the thought process that you carry as an individual is truly inspiring. And I think you have left uh, a lot uh, to think about in terms of we as entrepreneurs, when we scale new heights, what do we need to think the next day? David, thank you very much for joining us today evening. It's been a pleasure. It's been an honor. Look forward to seeing you very soon, my friend. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you for that. Thank you everyone for staying, whoever could, enjoy the drinks. Good, good stuff. Cheers, cheers. Very good. Sugar Thank you. Good, thanks. Thank you. 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 Thank